Not only in the way. Oh, wait. They're smiling yeah. even. Yeah. Rock and roll. Lock and load. Oh, wait, wait, so the, um, the granite test report every time I open it is the one. Right. You ready? Yeah, I'm done. We're ready. We're going. We're going. Coming out the gate. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome. Today is March the 14th, and this is a meeting of the Planning Commission. So I just want to make sure those who are in the audience are in the right place, and this is the right time. So the opportunities for the public to access, participate in the hybrid meeting are posted on the Albemarle County website, on the Planning Commission homepage, and on the Albemarle County calendar. Participation will include the opportunity to comment on those matters, which comments from the public will be received. Tonight on the agenda, we have one public hearing and one presentation. And so I would like to call this meeting to order and establish a quorum. Madam Clerk, would you mind calling the roll? Yes. Mr. Claiborne? Aye. We're present. Ms. Firehawk? Here. Mr. Murray? Here. Mr. Missile? Here. Mr. Carazana? Here. Mr. Bivens? Present. Thank you. All right. And a quorum is, has been established. The next item on the docket is other matters not listed on the agenda from the public. Are there any uh, members of the public here that wish to speak on anything that is not currently listed on the agenda? All right, seeing no one rush to the front, we will move to the next item on the agenda, which is approval of the consent agenda. You'll see that there is uh, the draft regular meeting minutes from February the 14th. Are there any comments or corrections uh, on that document? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as um, presented? So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All right, hearing none, Madam Clerk, can you call the roll? Yes. Mr. Murray? Aye. Ms. Firehawk? Aye. Mr. Claiborne? Aye. Mr. Missile? Aye. Mr. Carizana? Aye. Mr. Bivens. Aye. Thank you. All right. We'll go to our one and only public hearing tonight, which is SP 2022 0012. I did that. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's okay. City Church expansion. Um, Mr. McDermott, I'm sorry. Is there a staff report? Yes. Thank you. All right. <laughs> I'm uh, Rebecca Ragsdale, planning manager. I'll be giving the staff report for this item this evening. Um, we'll first kind of orient you to the location and the zoning and existing conditions of the site, and then we'll get into what the proposal is. Um, the site is there on your screen highlighted as um, the yellow pie-shaped triangle. Um, it's a religious assembly use known as City Church across from Belvedere Boulevard and between KTEC and the existing city neighborhood of Greenbrier. Um, <clears throat> and near Dunlora and the John Warner Parkway. And this is just sort of a zoomed in look at the site where you can see the existing building, existing parking areas, uh, wooded buffer in the back with the railroad tracks, the city neighborhood, <clears throat> excuse me, to the west and then across from 999 Rio, which you saw recently. I don't know that my pointer is working, but... <clears throat> Um, so again, the existing building and parking areas, wooded buffer and railroad track there, and across from Belvedere Boulevard and 99 Rio, excuse me, 999 Rio, the Dunlora neighborhood, and then um, another religious assembly use across Rio Road. <clears throat> the existing property is zoned R4. Um, that's the yellow on the map here. I've highlighted the existing site. There's a bit of R4 um, in this area along Ryle Road. The pink are the salmon and the lighter pink colors are commercial that are nearby, which is the other church across the road. And then what we refer to as Gasoline Alley, the car washes and the, and the gas stations along Ryle Road. The gray is the city of Charlottesville. And then we have um, what you saw recently, as I mentioned, the neighborhood model district of 999 Ryle across the road. So there's a bit of primarily commercial, but also non-residential uses with KTEC um, and re religious assembly uses and commercial nearby. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, again, the pie-shaped parcel highlighted in yellow um, is, zone, is, excuse me, is designated urban density residential in the master plan for this area. 
The blue area is institutional and then the, um, the yellow area, neighborhood density residential. Um, religious assembly uses are um, included as a secondary use in residential areas and are somewhat common as you know, in those areas of the master plan. The switching gears, this is a, um, an exhibit. This is the concept plan that's proposed for the site. Um, this is a, a use that has existed on the parcel since the 1980s. And there is an existing building and parking areas, as I mentioned before, and then the existing entrances off of Rio Road. Now there was a special use permit prior to this one that included a bigger um, request with up to 500 seats and redevelopment of the property. Um, but since that time, there's been some uh, rethinking to the church's needs. And this request before you this evening is for 320 seats, <clears throat> utilizing the existing building and parking areas and expanding them and building a multi excuse me, a multi-purpose building that would be a gym and also some offices, excuse me, offices to serve the church's needs. Um, along with that, there would be um, some grading and stormwater management facilities. Um, they were also approved with a spire, prior special use permit. <clears throat> and um, other, what we refer to as major elements of this proposal would be the 30 foot buffer that's along um, the western property line closest to the residential areas. Um, it's not uncommon with, with these types of proposals that we would um, recommend some buffering and screening against, against nearby residential areas. <clears throat> I think we mentioned in the staff report that it is zoned R4. There's a height limit of 35 feet and the building would be located to the rear of the parcel. Um, so we didn't have any concerns as far as um, impacts to the entrance corridor or um, additional impacts from this development. This is the concept plan. Following this, there would be the site plan, which would include the final landscaping details. The existing parking areas would be um, brought up to current code requirements for tree canopy and um, landscape islands and parking lot landscaping requirements. We did mention in the report, and we think it's important to note the recommendations of the Rio Corridor Plan. Um, we mentioned the um, continuous green tea across the road uh, with Belvedere Boulevard when you reviewed 999 Rio a few weeks ago. The concept plan for this site is um, has reviewed these recommendations and is not proposing anything that would preclude um, implementation of this plan with the write-in and write-out of their entrances and then the connection, the frontage road over to KTEC. Special use permits where you know we're focusing on what the impacts are or the increased impacts um, from the proposal to surrounding properties or the character of the area. There weren't any concerns about additional traffic impacts. We mentioned that um, there is consideration of the adjoining residential parcels. Um, we had the community meeting for this proposal and there were a lot of questions about traffic which were answered at that meeting and also some of the city neighborhood residents had some concerns about stormwater runoff, which will actually be improved for this site with, um, with a site plan and W water protection ordinance and erosion and sediment control measures that would be put in place with the new building. Our engineering staff did look into those concerns and it looks like there may be um, drainage from additional properties and other areas. Um, that might have been causing some of those concerns for the city residents. I mentioned um, with this proposal, it is an existing mm -hmm. use that is expanding to meet current needs or building a new building to meet current needs that is not that much out of character, which is the longstanding use that has been in place since the 1980s. And the comprehensive plan recognizes the need and secondary uses in residential areas such as um, this. The staff did recommend approval. Um, we did find factors favorable. We didn't have any concerns with this proposed use. These conditions of approval are in line with typical special use permit conditions um, that address cons consistency with the concept plan that's been submitted. Um, that would include the location of the building and parking areas and the wooded buffer. 
along with establishing um, the maximum capacity and providing for um, the area necessary to implement the Rio corridor plan. And it's pretty typical that we have an expiration um, for, for the use to commence, as we say. Um, we've allowed five years in this case. Um, the prior special use permit that was that I mentioned for the 500 seat um, and redevelopment of the site is expected to ex expire in May and they are moving forward with this um, proposal at this time. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, I didn't mention these conditions on the screen have been slightly tweaked in terms of wording um, at the suggestion of the county attorney's office, but they are substantively the same. So when you make your motion, we would, um, I'll, I've included that wording in terms of referencing these conditions as presented this evening and not the ones in the staff report. There's only minor wording changes. There isn't anything substantive that changed. All right, thank you for the staff report. Uh, commission, any questions for the staff? Right, Mr. Bivens? Thank you, Chair, just a bit of clarification. So if I'm understand correctly, SP 2017-010 is due to expire in May, and the applicant is not asking for that to be extended. That's correct. That hasn't been pursued in terms of site plans. Um, so this one would be in place of that. So this would be in place of that, okay. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. All right. Yeah. Oh. Commissioner Missile. Just a quick question, thanks. Um, the buffer on what I think is the south side, if I'm getting a north arrow right, it appears that the parking is going into the 10 foot buffer. I assume that 10 foot buffer is a building setback line and not a parking setback line. Bottom of the page. So the um, the buffer that we were referring to is along, well, I think I'm going to get my pointer straight. Was along this property line. Right, I understand that. That I'm would be 20 the... feet. And then the other setbacks are consistent with the residential requirements in the ordinance, um, which is 10 feet for, for that side segment. So my, my point is where your cursor is, just above your cursor right there. Mm -hmm. uh, mostly, right, there's eight or whatever, one, two, three, four, five parallel spaces to the right. Those are all in the buffer. So there's no setback requirement for parking. That was my question. And we didn't recommend a, a buffer requirement along that property Got line it. with KTEC. Got it. I I was using the wrong word, setback, right, got it. Okay, so it's in the setback, but it's fine because there's no setback requirement. Right. And then remind me, the, the critical slopes on the site, how are they being handled? Um, there are, this is within the development area, so we have managed and um, right. preserved slopes. So the slopes that would be impacted are the managed slopes. Oh, those were managed? Okay. Yes, so those are um, allowed to be impacted and they would meet the de the design standards of the ordinance. Got it. Thank you. That's all. Yeah. Any questions from this side of the dice? I'll just ask a quick question. I, I was thinking maybe Mr. Mitchell was getting into it, but um, so I know there's a the 20 foot wooded buffer that's to remain along the railroad tracks, and then I see where it swoops out a little bit. Are there any are there trees being removed to put in the stormwater management pond? Yes, there would be some tree removal. Um, and we mentioned the wooded areas to remain. The 20 foot buffer needs to be maintained. And then um, other than that, there are some trees in that area that would be impacted. Okay. Mr. Murray? And it's just a concept plan, but do we know is, is that proposed to be a biofilter or a retention pond? Um, so the final design would, would be um, addressed with the site plan. Um, and I think the applicant could probably address what they're they're leaning towards. I do have one question regards regarding timing of the projects. If hypothetically speaking, if the intersection improvements are funding, would this project be built before those are implemented? Kevin will have to help me, uh, Mr. McDermott, with the timing. Uh, without knowing the specific timing that the applicant's thinking, I would guess that it's very likely because the 
project is not funded at this time. It would be fun. It would it would be identified for funding in the next fiscal year, and then um, it would probably be about four years after that. So it, it's about it, it would be at least four years, I think, before we'd see any construction on that. Got you. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? No, then with that, we will open the public hearing and we will call for the applicant if they have a, a presentation. And, and welcome, and uh, I'll, I'll go over the rules. We look forward to your presentation and you'll have 10 minutes. Uh, green means good. Uh, when you get closer to the time of expiration, you'll see a yellow light, just a gentle reminder to make your, your most important points if you hadn't already made them. And then uh, at red, we'll ask that you respectfully stop and we'll turn it over to you, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much. My name is Chris Becker. I'm the operations pastor at City Church, and I've been there 18 years. Um, when we, we hit COVID three years ago, we were meeting at Charlottesville High School and having one service over there. And when COVID hit, we had to move back to our site back on Rio Road. And so when we moved back in there, we slowly started filling back up. And as we started filling back up, we noticed that our offices needed to be turned back into kids spaces. So we formed kids spaces downstairs and our offices, we now are all remote or meet in different kids spaces. And then we were like, well, the kids spaces aren't large enough, so we need larger space. So we are we are utilizing with an agreement with Harvest Church across the street, using their gymnasium every Sunday as well. So when we started thinking about it, we don't have offices, we don't have a large facility for our third, our first to fifth graders. We thought, hey, if we had a gym like this over on our site, it would work really well. And so that's kind of where this whole concept came from. Um, the previous SUP it was a big idea, but we said, hey, this was one that we could more manage and would fit the needs that we have now and should work pretty well. So that's the main gist and Craig Gutarski here. Hey everyone, I'm gonna, hopefully, I know there wasn't a lot of questions, but I'm gonna try to address those in a fairly brief PowerPoint. So- hey, Could you share um, your name? Yes, oh, Craig Gutarski with Timmons Group. Um, representing the applicant. So let's see, we go here. All right. So um, again, this is for multi space, uh, multi use space addition for the church. Um, essentially, we're asking for 10,600 square feet. It would add about 40 additional parking spaces. And um, I know 320. Oh, Dr drag it up. Oh, okay. Ah, okay. Um, Sorry. So, uh, so, so we're not asking for any more uh, seats within the sanctuary. It's 300. It's about 300, 310 today. So no more than 320. It's kind of based off of the parking number based on three, uh, uh, three seats or one parking space for every three seats. Um, and uh, additionally, just as Rebecca had already gone through, there was a special use permit where that is not no longer being pursued. As far as timing, I think what we're looking at here is probably construction starting about a year from the time that this is hopefully approved. Um, we we are working with a contractor, so there are there are some things in motion already with regards to that. Um, and, and the thought being that we would be completed before any of the uh, uh, Rio corridor improvements um, were to occur. Um, and again, this is location, which Rebecca kind of went over directly across from Belvedere. And this is the existing conditions map. Um, you can see the shaded area that is the managed slopes. Um, and as uh, Ms. Firehawk uh, pointed out, there are some trees that will be removed. Um, one of the things I would note as I flip over to the uh, layout um, that also shows uh, some conceptual grading is that we would be bringing the site up to speed with regards to some of the canopy requirements. Um, I think one of the things that 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 the that the uh, site is void of is really some trees over in the parking area. So this is an opportunity to kind of reduce some of that heat island effect just by getting some canopy over in that area. Um, as as uh, as far as the stormwater question that was asked, that with regards to is it a retention pond? Is it a biofilter? It's probably one of those two. I don't. Look, I wouldn't want it to be something that detained water, just because, again, one of the primary reasons for the addition is to accommodate kids space, youth space and that sort of thing. And so standing water is not always the greatest thing with them around. But what we do want to look at is how we can enhance 
uh, sort of the water quantity aspect with regards to what is draining um, over to the Greenbrier neighborhood. We did look at that as that was one of the key questions that came up during the community meeting. And I think Rebecca mentioned a lot of that water is actually coming from, and I think I'm turned around from my north, south, east, west directions, but it's coming from the other side of those train tracks, kind of up through Gasoline Alley. The church certainly does contribute some, but with this project, we would significantly be reducing um, the one-year event, as well as reducing down the 10-year storm event um, uh, that would be running off of the church's site. Um, so with that, that's kind of the end of the presentation. We're certainly here if there are any questions that any of you all have. Thank you. All right, thank you. Any questions from the commission? I'll start to my left. So I, I, at one point, there was some conversation that that around the road, and I guess I'm looking at Kevin about this, that there would be a way to come across their the applicant's property and tag in to go around KTEC and come into the parkway from there, and that that was perhaps a way to, to facilitate their exit, since I believe what we're going to do is only a right in, right out, and so people couldn't stop, because if I say any more, I will have mischaracterized traffic. At uh, Kevin McDermott, the uh, um, acting planning director. Yes, that's correct. Um, that the, in the Rio corridor plan, the uh, connection between City Church's parking lot and KTEC was conceptualized. Uh, we have not really moved forward with doing anything with that. Um, if the project to improve that intersection were to move forward, um, there is the roundabout at John Warner Parkway that is already funded, um, and, and that actually would probably be timed approximately about when they're talking about, I think, I think construction in that is around 2025. Um, so uh, that, that, that would be able to accommodate folks that wanted to head back towards 29 so you could make a right out and and go around the roundabout and come back also if this project were to move forward uh u-turn location would be available at the next street which is called like greenbrier terrace i believe is the next street on that same side so people coming from the city that wanted to access the church could go past it and make a u-turn and come in so that would be how access would be available Yes, sir. Thank you for your presentation. And question about I mean, it's significant to topography here, obviously. And so it looks like you're bringing in a, quite a bit of fill, right? I mean, there's very little cutting, right? It's going to be mainly fill that you're bringing into the site. Is that, is that correct? So conceptually, um, you know, the grading plan right now is conceptual. I think obviously we, we, we want to limit any amount of fill for, for the main cost or main reason being cost. Um, certainly there are some things that could be done with the building. If there's a retaining wall that kind of comes off the back edge of the building to sort of extend that down. Some of those items we're still working through. Um, and certainly that would be things that we would be addressing during the site plan level. Yeah, it just, it seemed to me that, um, even right after the building, you had significant grades that came right off of it. So, yeah, uh, and I get this is conceptual, but as you move into the site plan, maybe there's some things you can do to minimize that and and the slopes that you're creating on the sure on the backside, which would only obviously add to the runoff. And no, absolutely, and I think not only that, it's also you know the the where you have those steeper slopes. Um, it's it's land that's harder to use, right? Even in an informal sort of fashion, and I think certainly it's something that we we recognize and want to pay attention to um, uh, and, and will as we kind of move this through uh, the process. Yeah. And the other side of it is it, it would it would also help you to plant, right? Those yeah. steep slopes is kind of hard to. Uh, but thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. It's very conceptual right now. Just a quick question along the lines of it being conceptual. I'm just curious, the plan that we're looking at that was part of the staff report versus the one that you showed on the screen is different? Do you, do you have a preference? Is there a? Uh, if they are different, they they are probably pretty close. I don't think there was a lot that changed between um, the, from the comments that we received from staff. It and was then just the addressed. way the parking was treated, that edge. Parking okay. is all perpendicular on your plan on your screen. And this one's got that parallel parking. It, that all fit inside that setback. 
And yeah, so I think one of the things we were looking at is how to maximize kind of the parking on the site. Um, and so one of the areas that we looked is along that edge. We do think that there's uh, there's a little berm there that we'll need to work through. Um, but it, but I think it's really more of a matter of just wanting to um, uh, you know maximize sort of the parking that's available um, for folks, but but also recognizing you know the limitations of the sanctuary and that sort of thing. Got it. Okay, thanks. And then just curious, the all the flow coming off the parking area is mm -hmm. that intended to go into a pipe at some point and go to the back, or is it yeah? So I think one of the things that we would do. So the the, the way that the the addition is sort of sited on the building or sited at that parking lot, you'll have all that parking drain is sort of flowing towards that building. So one of the things that that we will kind of get more into during a design is. Um, placement of inlets, but not only placement of inlets, um, sort of thinking about what is overland relief, right? Such that if there is a clogged pipe or a clogged inlet that right. either one, there's a duplicative system that maybe runs the other way around the building yeah. um, to ensure that that there is something there, whether it's, whether it's a duplicate pipe system or overland relief in some way, those are things that we would certainly be looking at. Got it. Thank you. Any questions to my right? Can you, I have two questions. The first one is, can you say a little bit more about, I knew you were talking about where you met during COVID and needs, but I didn't really understand the story about why you needed this gym expansion. Could you just say a little bit more about what you're going to do with that building? Yeah. Well, we use the building frequently through the week, pretty much seven days a week. And we're always trying to find spots to put people in groups okay. of people. Uh, we also have small groups that meet in the community that are looking to meet in the church as well. Okay. And so one of the things that we're looking at doing is making sure that not only for kids on Sunday morning, where we're us utilizing the church across the street, we'd use it there, but then like our youth group meets in the sanctuary. So we're throwing balls and it's pretty crazy. Okay. So we'd have a gymnasium for the youth group, but then also for office space um, on the one side, and also just some storage spots as well as like throughout the week, there'd be extra room for small group meetings and uh, groups to come in. And so we can utilize the whole facility in a greater capacity. So for some of the smaller groups with that, are you imagining um, a community group might ask you to use the church space, for example, so not just groups that are maybe it's, subcommittees yeah. of the church, but also additional community. It's both in. It's both in. We get requests a lot okay. from the community and as far as we can accommodate them, we allow, allow it. And then there's uh, groups within the church as well. Okay, yep. thank you. All right, and then a, just a question about, um, so I, I I appreciate that we're getting stormwater management for a site that didn't have any because it likely predates requirements for stormwater management. Uh, but what you've got this big sort of grassy field off to the other side that is not treed, it's just lawn art. Are you currently, do you have plans for that part of the site for the future? Or are you using it for picnics or what's going, because you just got this sort of big open space yeah, so during COVID, we created an open field with a platform so we could have a services out there. And so we utilized it for services for a long time. And just this past year, we decided not enough people were coming for that type of service, but we wanted a meeting spot out there for our kids and for our youth as well. And so we also wanted a green space throughout the week to have different, you know, groups of kids or, you know, adults meet out there. So it's going to continue just being a green okay. space past the parking lot. So that's the plan for that. Okay, thank you. Not a question really, but just a comment suggestion. Um, you have these parking islands that are proposed in the co concept plan. Just remember you can use those parking islands to treat stormwater. And you know, if you're gonna put trees in there, allowing some of that stormwater flow in there reduces the amount of watering you have to do on those trees. That's very helpful. Um, at Crozet Elementary near, near me, one of the things they've done with their biofilter there was they actually had little pavers so that children could walk into the biofilter and learn about the plants that were there so they made it as an educational space. So just some something else you might consider as a way to get value out of that space in addition to treating stormwater. Sure. Any other questions? Uh, all right. I have a couple. Um, let's see if I can put them in a logical order for you. Um, in terms of construction, when you all undertake that process there, will you be able to maintain the minimum number of parking? Assuming you have to lose some for staging and equipment and things like that. So current, so currently the church has an agreement with KTEC. So a lot, a lot of, uh, a lot of the parking actually occurs over at KTEC, and there's a path 
uh, that leads to the church. So from that perspective, that lot, you know, the K-Tech lot probably is on a, on a, on a Sunday, maybe 50% full at the very most. So there's plenty of overflow parking there. And I would imagine that that would be an agreement that would remain in place throughout construction. Okay, cool. Um, I know we've talked a lot about stormwater management. Just wondering if you could talk a little bit about other sustainability principles you're, you're looking at as you undertake this design process. Well, I think, I mean, I think as a designer, I mean, I think that's one of the things that we're always trying to think about, whether it's stormwater or whether it's, you know, the amount of pavement that we're, that we're using, or even, the, you know, when we talk about tree canopy, I think it's important that, you know, as we kind of uh, progress through this, that that is uh, sort of at the forefront and that we're using, you know, native materials and things that are easily accessible here. Um, so I think that's all part of the conversation that we'll have. Um, also with the, the our design build contractor um, to ensure that they're sort of thinking in that way in that fashion um, throughout throughout the process. Um, there's a lot of that that obviously goes into the buildings, which I know you guys are all well aware of. Sure. And one thing that prompted that question was, you know, it's like a sea of asphalt when you turn in. That's kind of the first thing you see. So just want to ask that question. And lastly, this is more of just a comment. It's like a concept plan. It was like the dumpster pad is kind of put right at the front entrance. And so maybe thinking through that a little bit and where that goes. If I'm reading the plan correctly, it's like it's a sidewalk that goes right into your addition and then there's a dumpster pad that's kind of tucked right there. And I've never really seen a handsome dumpster area, right? So. Uh, you, you're correct. I, I think obviously we want to have that screened. I think that maybe more of a placeholder. And uh, I, I think certainly there's some space also in the rear of the building. I think one of the things we're trying to think about is access for it. And obviously, you know, making sure that we can get a dumpster or, a, or a, a, a truck back there and turned around and that sort of thing. But that's something that I, I, I think is a great comment and certainly something that we'll take a look at. Okay. All right. Thank you. Let, one, quick, yeah, sure. one last question. What's the current maximum assembly <clears throat> for your sanctuary the number do you know um it's probably right around 330 to 340 if we really pack it in but okay. uh, that's probably the rough it's one of the staff recommendations says it had be should be limited to a maximum 320 seat sanctuary i just want to make sure that's not reducing your capacity i feel like it's reducing maybe a little bit but i don't know what was on the books before okay i don't know why we would reduce it but <laughs> want to double check. Less people yeah <laughs> Okay, thanks. Strange. Does staff want to respond to that? My understanding is that the current condition limits it to a 320 seat uh, sanctuary. And so that's not a reduction. That's just a continuation of the existing condition. Got it. Um, Thank you, Council. Well, actually, the prior special use permits didn't limit the sanctuary. And when they came in with the most recent amendment, it was 500. So 320 is more in line with kind of like what they have now. And we typically um include a condition to establish the sanctuary so it's really like mr herrick said it's not really a change in terms of intensity it's just yeah. establishing what that maximum is um <clears throat> consistent with their operations so that maximum could be 350 if it was more in keeping with your current operations i guess right well the arbitrary the concept plan and the traffic information and the parking is based on 320 i see okay <clears throat> good to know thank you just for our knowledge, what is the size of your congregation? Just so we know, roughly. Um, so probably on a Sunday morning, we have about 550 people on a regular week, but we have three services. Oh, yeah. I'll just say, oh, that blew that out of the water. <laughs> no, 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 no. Oh, yeah, multiple okay. services. So. <laughs> All right. Any other questions for the applicant? All right. Thank you both. And uh, we will call to see if there's any comments from the public. That's in person. All right. Madam Clerk, is there anyone online? No, sir. Nobody has their hand up at this time. All right. Well, with that, we will close the public hearing. And we'll bring it in amongst ourselves. And so open up the floor for any initial thoughts, reactions. Seems like a pretty straightforward uh a continuation of a use that's already occurring so we already all agree that a church is an appropriate use for the site and I think it's I, I kind of got a chuckle when I was imagining the kids all being rambunctious and running amok and needing more space I, I feel you on that so uh, it seems like it seems like uh, and I also appreciated the comment about uh, making the space available to community groups as well so they're providing a civic service so anyway it, it seems like a great proposal to me I don't have any concerns at this time 
Any other thoughts and reactions? Commissioner Bivin. I, I have no concerns also, um, Chair, but what I, I guess when I first saw this coming through, when I, when I saw it was an expansion of space, I actually had a vision that perhaps they were gonna come before us and ask us to put a multi a multifamily unit there. <laughs> and so of course I was real happy. <clears throat> But then when I realized that it was a gymnasium, well, I was still happy, but I wasn't as happy because I was really anticipating having a really sort of big smile about us having a, um, a multifamily, um, or, or, yeah, multifamily units on, on that piece of property right next to all that transportation and schools and walkability and all of the things that we claim we want in a dense area, but we just don't seem to be able to get it. But that is for another conversation at another time. Your point is well taken, sir. Well taken. In, any other comments? Uh, no, I, I agree. This seems fairly straightforward. I, I, it is a challenging site, so just encourage us as we walk through the work through the site plan. I think there's a number of issues that need to be addressed there. Um, but yeah, so good margin. This is more of just a, confirm, a confirmation from staff, you know, reading about the, the two ways into the site. During the site plan process, there'll be a requirement for signage that says, you know, right, right exit only or whatever it may be. Yes, um, and we mentioned um, <clears throat> during the site plan process, that's when we would review the landscaping and any additional pedestrian crosswalks and sidewalk gaps that need to be filled in. Okay. <clears throat> Well, hearing no other comments or discussion, is anyone prepared to make a motion? I'm happy to make a motion. Uh, I move to adopt a resolution, attachment D, to SP 2022-12 City Church Amendment for the reasons stated in the staff report and with the staff conditions presented. Okay, is there a second? Second. All right, any further discussion? Did, did we need to be specific? Yeah. You said that there were some differences in the what was the conditions presented on the screen tonight from what was in the staff report. Do we need to specifically note that? Um, that was part of the motion that it would be the conditions as presented. As presented, because I thought he said in the staff report. Right. Um, so it wouldn't be the staff report that would be referenced. It was the conditions as presented. Yes, and I apologize. This motion is not entirely as it should be for the commission because you're making a recommendation. This is. Um, um, yeah. So you would make a recommend, sorry about that. You would move to adopt, or excuse me, move to recommend approval of this um, special use permit with the conditions as presented by staff. At the meeting. At the meeting, yes. yes. Thank you. So Mr. you need to amend your motion. I will amend my motion to what staff just said. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any further discussion? All right, Madam Clerk, can you call the roll? Yes. Mr. Bivens? Aye. Mr. Carazana? Aye. Mr. Missel? Aye. Mr. Claiborne? Aye. Ms. Firehawk? Aye. Mr. Murray? Aye. Thank you. All right, well, thank you, and best of luck as you take your proposal forward. Next on our docket is an affordable housing developer incentives presentation by Dr. Stacy Pethia. We will now be ready to hear the presentations. Good to see you. Good evening, Stacy Pethia, um, housing policy manager. It's nice to see all of you. It's been a while since I've been here. Um, and the presentation tonight is not really focused on developer incentives. It's just an overall update of what's been happening in housing since July 2021. Sorry, I can't see the screen. There we go. <laughs> so again, tonight, I'm just providing an update um, on housing activities that have been happening since the adoption of Housing Albemarle in July 2021. Um, and we're going to go over just a real brief summary of what that activity has looked like and then get a bit more specific about certain things. Um, including giving an update on the affordable housing stock in the county, a uh, brief update on activities, funding activities with Southwood, um, uh, funding awards that were made for affordable housing over the last couple uh, fiscal years, 
And then we'll talk a little bit about the affordable housing grant program that's being proposed. Um, I don't have details on that yet. Those are being finalized. So this is really just sort of a brief overall view of what that will look like. Um, and then a bit of a discussion about a proposed affordable dwelling unit ordinance. Um, and then a few other activities that are on our workload for the next year. Uh, so here's a real brief um, timeline of what's been happening. Again, Housing Albemarle was adopted in July of 2021. Um, and since then, the board did approve in January of 2022 um, funding to hire a housing project manager to assist with all of this. Um, I am happy, really happy to say that after 11 months search, uh, we have hired a staff person in December of last year. Um, and they're really focusing a lot of their efforts on Southwood and the CDBG grant that's going on there. So that's been really helpful. Um, in February 2022, we did have a work session with the board on a proposed affordable housing overlay that didn't really go very far. So that's been pushed out of the way. Um, and then we had a, a meeting with them again in May of that year uh, to really talk about an affordable dwelling unit ordinance. At that time, they did pass a resolution of intent to amend the zoning code for that. Um, and we have a meeting scheduled with them later this, uh, I believe, in April. Um, and after that, we will come to all of you with a work session to discuss that as well. Um, we did provide funding in April and July of last year uh, and had another work session with the board that's coming up. Um, and that brings us pretty much to today. So looking at the affordable housing stock, these numbers are current as of May of last year. Staff is working on collecting the new numbers, which will be published um, next month as well, or in May, sorry. So currently there are 2,157 affordable housing units in the county. Those include both rental and for sale units. Um, about 1,400 of those are subsidized rental units. So those include low-income housing tax credit and other federally funded units. Um, some of those are property units that have been completed, um, 58 for sale units that have been purchased by income qualified buyers, um, and then 518 property units that are for rent and being rented currently. Uh, it also includes units that have been um, rehabilitated by AHIP through the Homeowner Rehabilitation Program and um, 99 bonus density units, and that is the Brookdale property. Um, in the pipeline, um, as of last May, there were uh, about 1,500 units that are in the pipeline. Um, almost 900 of those are for subsidized rental units, again, primarily low-income housing tax credit, uh, as well as 653 proffered units, and those include both rental and for sale. Looking at Southwood, I know you've heard a lot about, I had a couple updates last year. Um, this is really just looking at the funding side of things. Uh, and if all of you remember, or most of you should remember, there was a performance agreement that was signed in 2019 that provided $3.2 million in funding. 1.8 million of that was cash through the housing fund. Um, and that was dispersed over six disbursements as Habitat met uh, six milestones. All six of those milestones have been met. So all of the cash contribution has been distributed. Uh, the remaining funds, 1.4 million, is going to be provided through real property tax rebates. Um, and those should start within this year, I believe. Um, and so that is really focused on phase one funding. There is a hierarchy of usage for those funds. Uh, first and foremost, those funds should be used to construct habitat homes. Um, after that, uh, those funds can be used to pay down construction-related debt. And finally, any funds that that can't be used for those other two purposes really can be put away and set aside for phase two construction. Um, we were awarded a $1 million community development block grant. Um, those funds are being used to construct five single family homes. I believe there's one single family detached and the other units are um, duplexes, thank you. <laughs> uh, and $40,000 of that $1 million is being used to construct uh, a small tribute park in Village 2 that is honoring the Monacan Indian Nation heritage on that site. Um, and then in 2023, 
Uh, FY23 funding through the housing fund, we did award $306,000 to um, Habitat to help with rental assistance um, as people, residents in phase two need to move to accommodate uh, construction. So that is really short-term re rental assistance to help with relocation. Um, looking at the larger funding that we did in FY22 and 23, uh, we did award $12.4 million through a variety of sources. Um, again, there was the CDBG funding, but also through the AG, a, mm, agency budget review team, <laughs> which covered uh, a variety of housing related topics. There was about $118 in home investment partnership funding. That's the federal government that is to help construct one house um, in Habitat, uh, sorry, Southwood. Um, $2.7 million in American Rescue Plan Act funding. And that was really focused um, primarily on the Premier Circle Permanent Supportive Housing Project that is uh, should be starting hopefully starting construction later this year. There has been a delay due to the construction cost rising. They are going back uh, next month to apply for additional low-income housing tax credits to fill that funding gap. Um, and then house, uh, revenue through the housing fund was about $4.8, $4.9 million. Um, and all around, the, all of this funding really supported uh, the construction of 724 affordable rental units. Uh, the and 352 owner occupied units that also includes rehabilitation, um, safe shelter and services for 200 victim 200 victims of domestic violence, services and shelter for 406 individuals and families experiencing homelessness, um, and housing counseling services for 558 households. So I think we did a pretty good job over the past two years and and really diversified how we are serving the county. Um, so for the affordable housing grant program, again, I don't have details on this yet, um, but I can say um, it's really focused on uh, implementing housing Albemarle strategy 2C, which is to provide incentives to increase the production of rental housing. Um, it is authorized under section 15.2-958 of Virginia code, uh, which allows the county to provide grants or loans for the development or rehabilitation of multifamily rental housing. Um, it can also be used for individual homeowners who um, need to do some housing rehabilitation, but we don't have this, we're not set up to do that yet. Um, property owners under, uh, under the enabling legislation, um, in order to receive the loans, they would need to provide a minimum of 20% of the residential units as affordable housing. Um, with a minimum affordability period of 10 years, but the county is allowed to set that at a longer term. So to go in line with housing Albemarle, that would be a 30 year affordability period. Um, and staff is proposing that the grant program be structured as a real property tax rebate. And that's all I have right now. So we'll give you more details later. Um, the affordable dwelling unit ordinance, I'm sure many of you uh, know what this is or have heard about it. It is enabled under Virginia Code 15.2, uh, Section 15.2, Um, This is the one that only a select few uh, localities in Virginia have and is really wide open what we can do with it. Um, and so under that, a county ordinance um, is able to require a percentage of the total residential units be set aside as affordable. Uh, we can set affordability levels for those units, um, as well as the length of affordability, uh, establish a per unit cash in lieu fee, and incentivize construction of units beyond the density increase. Um, again, staff is scheduled to have a work session about a proposed ordinance with the board on April 19th. Um, once that work session happens, uh, staff will incorporate the board's comments and feedback from that, and then we will schedule a work session with all of you to do the same thing. Um, and finally, uh, there are a few other projects on board. So at the top, again, you see the affordable housing grant program and the ADU ordinance um, and updating the annual regional housing report, which is where those first uh, pie charts came from uh, for last year's report. We are also working on creating an affordable housing housing waiting list uh, that will be directly connected to the property units and any units through uh, an ADU ordinance. Um, and that's the best way 
We know to be able to connect income qualified buyers or um, renters directly to those units. Um, one of the issues we have with proffer units currently, uh, particularly with the, the for sale units, is that we're, it's really hard to connect those with uh, income qualified buyers. So this is a way to do that. Uh, the plan is to start small initially, kind of work out the details and any kinks in the system. Um, and so we will start with the police foundation and county staff. Um, and once we get everything down to a, a, a good process, we will open it up countywide. Um, we are also developing a tool to track implementation of housing Albemarle and how we are working towards meeting those objectives and goals. Um, and we are also waiting to hear a final word on whether or not uh, we will be awarded an infrastructure grant from uh, DEQ. Uh, we have not made the tentative list. They uh, they released the grant award, uh, the tentative awards um, last week. There were 20, I believe they had 258 applications. 24 projects have received tentative offers of grants. Uh, we did make the contingency list, so there are 14 of us on there. Um, so we will have a firm answer by the middle of April. Um, if we do end up on that list, we, we are offered uh, an award, then that will put um, a good deal of work on our plate. Uh, the agreement with Southwood was that the county would manage the project ourselves instead of them. So we have a whole bunch of people uh, waiting breathlessly to find out if we got the money. And that is all I have for you tonight. I know that was really quick, um, but everything's kind of been moving fast and I don't have great details on anything, but I am happy to answer any questions you have. All right, thank you. Thank you for a great report. I'll start to my right. Any any questions for Dr. Pethia? Sure. I know the Stonewater Conservation District has um, helped a lot with some of the septic problems that people have had, and that that's a, a big way that the people have been able to stay living in their homes, particularly in the rural area in, in Alamo County. And I was wondering if you could speak to that and the pro and how how that funding has been used in partnership with the Department of Health and with AHIP and other people to help deal with these septic issues and keep people in their houses? Yeah, unfortunately, um, depending on how you look at it, I don't manage that program. That really goes through our, um, on the finance and budget, budget department. So I don't have a lot of details on that, but I, we can get some for you. I think it'd be a great other slide in here because I think it's another aspect of housing and how we're helping people stay in their houses and keeping housing affordable that, that I'd love to see the, the county take note of. Yeah, so we we do we have been using some of the ARPA funds in order to do that. Um, but again, I'm not managing that program, so I know very little. I can, however, get some detailed updates and share those after the meeting. Yep, go ahead. I have a couple questions. I'll just ask them um, one at a time. So uh, great report. I appreciate the brevity. <laughs> so, um, uh, I would like to ask, though, um, when you do the sort of the the overall progress annual report, and you know, obviously, you're reporting on the number of units that have been provided and different types of units and all that stuff. Do you do, do you also, as part of that report, look at how many units have maybe moved out of affordability? In other words, you know, like are we winning? You know, like we we built this many, <laughs> but then two thousand more became unaffordable because the market's crazy. Right. I'm just curious how you factor in that analysis, or not, if you do. We Not yet. That That is something we're moving towards. I just don't have a good tracking system in place yet, so that's part of the tracking tool that we're trying to create. Um, we are able to, there, there is a national group that does track um, assisted housing, so whether those are moderate rehab, Section 8 funding, uh, low-income housing tax credits, <clears throat> so pretty much anything that has like a HUD or, or, or federal subsidy behind it, they track those expir expiration periods. So those I can track if they are. Um, I'm thinking more about the overall housing stock. Yeah. You know, it, so our, the, me the median price of a house keeps climbing and climbing. And so I'm just trying to get a sense of if we're winning the war. 
I, I, I'm, my gut tells me no. Okay. <laughs> but we, we don't have a good source. We don't have a good way to track that yet. So those are things that I'm working on. Something to think about or figure out how yeah. to develop if possible. I, I'm not here to propose a solution. I don't know either. Um, all right. And then the other question I had has more to do with um, the, the, the period time frame. So the first time frame question is, um, have we considered requiring, and I don't know if we can require this, requiring a longer period for affordable housing rentals, as well as for sale units to have to be on the market? Uh, because, you know, we, we, we have had that problem with, you know, the developer does it, the development and they say, well, no, you know, I had 20 affordable units, but nobody, you know, 10 people applied right. and the other 10 went back to market rate. Is that something that the county could legislate as a, because it doesn't seem like a very long time period for somebody say who might need extra house counseling and their right. loan could take longer to get or whatever. I'm, I'm not I, I, I that that's you what you want to make sure that the developers so that they're not hanging on them so onto them so long that they're losing money. Um, right. But you're right. We need to find a way to to make keep them affordable longer. Um, and one way we could do that is through an affordable dwelling unit program ordinance, um, and it would still have that period probably 90 days. Uh, but you could change the program to tweak it to say that, right, at the end of the 90-day period, if you don't have an income qualified buyer, you can sell it to anyone, but we can restrict that resale price for 40 years. So it seems like the, just not to interrupt, but it, I feel like the the 90 days you just said sounds a lot longer than what we've heard from people who stood here and made proposals. Correct. This is why an affordable dwelling unit ordinance is good. Okay. Because <laughs> um, that's where we can put some of those requirements in that no, we can't necessarily do with the proper system as it is. Right. Um, so an ADU ordinance would allow us to set those periods that say, right, you have to market that for 90 days. Um, we could work in something that says after the first 60 days, if you don't have an income qualified buyer, you have to open it up to nonprofits to purchase the unit. Okay, I got you. And then at the end of 90 days, you can sell it to anyone, income qualified or not, but that price is restricted. The resale price is restricted for 40 years. So okay. someone could come in earning $200,000, pay $210, $200,000 for a house. Um, and they would only be able to sell it for what is the next affordable price. Gotcha. That That's great. And then the, the second part of that question in terms of time period is um, how long the, like, for example, the for rent units are affordable. So 10 years is a common period. We did have an applicant who put 20 years uh, forward. Is that, some, I know that we want it to be attractive to the development community so that they will propose these units. I'm just curious if that's also part of the mix of, because I just think of it as like a ticking time bomb. There's a certain right. hope that the person renting the affordable apartment for 10 years will achieve more in life and move up the ladder in their career and then be able to afford that price when it changes. But there's a lot of jobs that just doesn't happen. And so it's like, just like a we're just deferring the right. problem for some folks who are not going to be able to afford that when that, that time period ends. So is that Increasing that time period, is that something we can do or should do? Yeah. So the housing policy recommends extending that from 10 years to 30 years. Okay. Um, and awesome. you can do that through that through an ADU ordinance. Okay. Thanks. Hey, working to my left, Commissioner Missile. Great. Thank you. Uh, first and foremost, thanks for everything you're doing for this um, missional goal and objective. Here, here. That's awesome. Uh, forgive me if I'm jumping around here. I just have a, a few questions. One, the tracking tool. That's a great, that will be a great thing to have, I think. And yeah. to Commissioner uh, Firehawk and previously to Commissioner Carazana's points about knowing how well we're doing, kind of checking to see, I think it'd be important. One thing I I was curious about is will the tracking tool, may, you may not know this yet, but Will the tracking tool include some more kind of subjective measures like quality of the housing? Um, so, uh, or equity, or I don't know, those those types of things versus just pure numbers. That's a good question. Um, 
I'll have to figure out how to put that in. I mean, there's, that's important data to have. Um, one of the things we have started doing with our um, funding agreements through the housing fund is we do collect household demographic data to go mm -hmm. along with that. So we will be able to say, um, you know, how many people are in the household, if uh, they're female headed, single parent, um, if there's anyone with a disability, seniors, how many children, race and ethnicity um, and income level. Um, so that type of data we can collect. Um, I'll have to think about other types that we can put in there as well. Uh, they may have to come sort of overall sources from the census mm -hmm. data, but sure. absolutely we can put stuff but in. Like, but like right. to ask you a question, were you were you thinking of things like um, if there's six people and they're living in a two bedroom apartment, you know, like, is that good? Or is it six people living in a three bed? Like, what's yeah, the quality? Are, are we squishing people in, or, the, or are the units really tiny? Like they're all tiny houses or, yeah. you know. So I think, um, and I'm, I don't mean to steal your thunder here. It was just such a great idea. But you you had mentioned the fact that, you know, losing poor quality affordable housing is still losing affordable housing. And, and so I think it's important for us to understand if we're losing poor quality affordable housing and replacing it with much better affordable housing, that's a good thing, right? But have those people had to leave their home because of that? And are they then driven out to some other who knows right. where, right? Or are they retained and can they stay in their homes? And what does that look like? So I think this tracking tool things, not to make a bigger, <laughs> a bigger project for you, but I, I mean, I think it'd be, it would be great to have the ability to somehow have input into that if it's helpful to you. Okay. Um, related to that a little bit is this, uh, the idea of the wait list that you brought up. And I was curious, you mentioned several times it's income qualified. Mm -hmm. Are there other measures that you look at, again, related to diversity, equity, inclusion, and those more sort of subjective things? Or is that not possible? Do you have to purely focus on income qualified? It is, we, we would have to focus on income qualified okay. um, because uh, after that, you run the risk of uh, running into fair housing issues. That's what I figured, yeah. Yeah, so it's keeping it, looking at income is the safest path forward. Okay, good to know. Um, shameless question, is, is there the possibility of you providing us a glimpse into what you're thinking for developer incentives? I, honestly, what I told you on that slide is what I know as okay. of today. Uh, what we're really trying to figure out is, um, it, it, do, do we need to cap the amount of property tax rebated each year? Mm -hmm. uh, for example, Washington, D.C. has uh, recently implemented a tax abatement program for affordable housing. Yeah. Um, in FY24, they will cap the amount of property taxes that they will abate across the entire, all the areas that they're uh, applying this program at $400,000. Um, so it's kind of first come first serve. The following fiscal year, they will increase that to $4 million and then to $416 million, I think, um, or four point, I, I forget the exact amount, but if, and then it will increase, but they really do limit um, how much tax. So that's what, that's what we're looking at. I just don't know what that answer is at, until next week. <laughs> so I, I, not to sound like, um, so I'm just thinking like things like tap fees, real estate taxes, housing, uh, let's see, density bonuses, cash contributions, et cetera, all those things you're looking at. I they, yeah, this is specifically focused on a property tax rebate right? Um, right. To, and to help to uh, support construction or provision of those units as affordable housing. Got it. Um, you mentioned under the Virginia Code 15.2.2304 it, that um county may establish per unit cash in lieu fee amount correct and is that something that would then pay into a larger fund it would um it, it's being recommended well currently the uh, cash in lieu payments for housing proffers go into the housing fund and so this money will do the same thing it would be the same thing yeah. and how is the housing fund um funds how are the housing fund funds distributed how uh, what's the what's the qualifications process and so there has been um 
in the past, it has been uh, when my predecessor was here, when there there was never a lot of uh, large sums of money. So when he had money in the housing fund, he would send an email to the nonprofits um, requesting them to send uh, proposals in, and then he would decide which ones are funded, or he would take the money and divide it evenly among them, or he would make those decisions, take the recommendations to the Board of Supervisors. We are looking at implementing a competitive application process, so there would be uh, a request for proposals um, issued annually uh, with, with the very specific set of requirements to respond with, and there will be um, an evaluation matrix to review those um, and then pull together a review team uh, from different county departments that can review those, make recommend, you know, score them, and then those recommendations for funding will be taken to the board. Got it. Okay. So you, you mentioned DC. Um, Alexandria has a housing advisory committee, as I'm sure you're aware, and yes. they administer those funds. So you're thinking it'd be something similar to that. Yeah, I mean, initially, so one of the recommendations in the housing policy is to create a housing advisory committee, mm -hmm. um, which could potentially be utilized for that purpose. Um, that's that's coming in the future. That's not together yet. So uh, initially, it would be um, representatives from different county departments. Um, I've reached out to economic development, and they would have someone available. Mm -hmm. Um, probably the Office of Equity and Inclusion. I don't have everybody together yet, so it, it would be an internal team at first. Interesting. So potentially community members. When you say internal team, you, you're you thinking just in the county? Itself? Yeah, just in the county to start and then okay. figure out the best way to open it up to other yeah. people. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. And last question, the housing fund itself, what is the current balance in the housing fund, roughly? I'm going to say roughly about six hundred fifty thousand um, dollars, and then it will get more funding with the next fiscal year budget. Got it. So on slide six, I'm maybe I'm just misunderstanding. But there's a housing fund reserve, which was four point eight million. Are we talking about two different things? That's how much money we um, issued uh, out of that fund. out of that fund. And there's only six hundred left. Yes. Does that continue to grow? I guess only if developers. Correct. So about once or twice a year, um, when there's a, a pool of, of uh, cash and lieu payments through proper cash payments, um, those get transferred to the housing fund. Um, and generally, um, through the budget process, more funds are placed into there. So um, in the Got it. budget, Got it. upcoming budget, it's recommended that $3.9 million be placed in. I see. So it's re, it's re up there every year. Correct. I got gotcha. you. Okay. Uh, and this is still part of the same question. So, <laughs> um, the uh, the amount of money that's paid in lieu per year on average, or recently, I didn't. I'm not sure if that was in here, but what is that? Do you know? I, you know, I don't know. It varies. I mean, it, it's when when payments come in, and then I don't. I don't know. I'd have to actually go and look. Here's what yeah, percentage I, that I is know. of the. You know, versus the developers actually build the houses. Yeah, I, you know, I don't, I don't know. I have to look. Okay, that's all. Thanks very much. Sure. All right, Commissioner Carrizano. Thanks, Stacey. Really appreciate the presentation and 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 the analytics. And I think we've talked about this a number of times in terms of how do we get better analytics? How do we understand the housing stock that we might be losing? Uh, because I think that is a missing piece here. I mean, it's great to see. Okay, we have you know, twenty one hundred fifty seven affordable housing today and 1,500 coming online. I mean, that looks like a huge increase, right, percentage-wise. However, there's a missing piece, right, right? <laughs> that it would be great to understand. Um, so one question is, how do you see this analytic building? What are some other pieces that you see coming in? And, and how do you see it um, beginning to inform the comp plan? Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> Not a question I, I was expecting tonight. <laughs> um, I, I think there's a couple of things that can happen. Um, again, going back to the housing policy, and sorry to keep doing that, but um, there, there is a recommendation to do um, an affordable housing survey. Um, that could be annually. That's kind of a big lift, having done these before. Uh, so potentially every other year, every five years. But that would go out to the rental properties in the county. 
um, we would collect all types of information and that that would give us a good sense of you know the new developments uh, which ones you know, how old they are what they're renting for um who's living in them where they're located so that that's a really good source to start with um, and we could ask additional questions that goes along um <coughs> excuse me uh, years ago, Prince William County, I, I helped uh, put one together for them. Um, they had asked questions about <coughs> um, so energy efficiency um, features within units. Uh, Montgomery County often um, uh, combined theirs with some fair housing information questions through their Office of Human Rights. So there's all types of different information we can collect across the years through that tool. Um, again, that's a huge undertaking. So uh, it's probably not something we could do every year, um, but it's something to look at uh, for to, to get done in the future within the next couple of years and, and do it so many years after that. Um, I think that's the best way to get a really good handle of the housing stock in the county um, on the rental side. For home ownership, it's really looking more at census data, unfortunately, um, but getting better at tracking, keeping good track of the property units. So we have not had a really good tool. Um, I've been working with the planners to figure out how we can track those better over time um, and to create a take what they collect um, and put it into my own database some way so that we can keep track of that. Um, I think those are some of the best ways we can do that. And then again, as issues come up, if we want to know more about um, energy efficiency activities, um, local nonprofits like AHIP has a good handle on that through the affordable housing side. So really looking at partners to collect information from them um, and just collect as many sources as we can. Um, and and probably going to start off, I'll be honest, pretty small, but we will build on that tool over time as, as we have the capacity to do so. Yeah, well, I, I appreciate that. I mean, and part of the reason I'm asking is is because as we move into the comp plan, and of course, you're, we're setting goals and priorities and affordable housing is going to be one of those goals, right? It's not going to change. Right. However, how we approach affordable housing should change. My, I I, I, I believe I agree with you when you stated you're we're probably losing footing here or losing the war. As a, and I think we all feel that way here because we're, we're losing traction, right? As cost of construction keeps going up, even our AMI, I mean, what are we looking at now? 380,000 if you're at 80% or whatever it is, it's wow. something like that, right? So is that affordable, <laughs> right? So that, that's a different question. Is okay, I'm not gonna, we're not gonna go into that right now, but. Uh, so, so I do think that these tools will help us. And, and so I truly encourage you to develop as, as many as you can, as much of this information so we can get a good picture and, and we don't repeat the same mistakes or, you know, right, the definition of insanity, right? You do the same thing over and over again and expect the same result. So hopefully we can, we can then set these goals and agendas and truly understand what has been working, what hasn't been working, where are there some models that have been, and so Ahab I think is a great uh, program, and I'm 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 looking at I'm looking at your 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 pie charts. Um, so if, if if I'm reading this right, I mean the preserved units are those mainly that Ahab was at 34, and I see nothing coming online on that. So is there um, is there a, so how, how is that incentivized? Is there a way that we can incentivize. So I know there are there are some communities that do that. They incentivize developers instead of saying, "Okay, we're going to build um, ten homes in our in our development, and they're going to be three hundred eighty thousand dollars homes," or we're going to put money into a pot, the a pot or another that is going to help to keep people in their homes. And what other communities have, have seen is that they can actually get a lot more bang for their buck. Yep. And we're not talking about $300,000 homes. Right. Um, and so, and it's a way of maintaining your housing stock. So I'm just wondering, is there an issue incentivizing that kind of, oh, cause I, again, I'm not seeing any of those preservation preserved homes right. coming online in the 1,552 that are Correct. So that's really tracking the new units um, and, and what we fund AHIP to do. Um, we do have the potential to create a separate program that would provide, we could provide funds directly to 
homeowners to help with home renovations, um, upgrades, energy efficiency upgrades. It is easier um, and more efficient for county staff to partner with AHIP and with LEAP and other nonprofits to do that. Um, because they're set up and already used to to doing that type of work, they also have the system set up to be able to track the the funds that are provided to homeowners. Um, there's absolutely no reason that we would not be providing more money to um, AHIP or to LEAP in the future. Uh, we have several pots of money out to them now. Um, we've just given them four hundred twenty one thousand uh, dollars last year to do housing rehab in the county. Um, they have also gotten an additional. Um, $500,000 between the housing fund and climate action fund to do energy efficiency work. So uh, the money goes out um, and we do collect that information through the grant process. Um, we provide that, that data as grants and they have to send us a, a report. So we just haven't been able to collect that information in one good spot. Well, I appreciate it. And again, just encourage you to provide as, as clear a picture of the housing Absolutely. as possible. And I know there's a lot of analytics and this is a great start, uh, but I think it, it, it would be really needed in the comp plan as we move forward with that and try to set those those policies for the future. Thank you. Commissioner Bivens. Am I correct in understanding that you now are in office of one and a half or two? We're two now. Okay. So a lot of what you're are you pointing out <laughs> that's exactly where I'm going. So a lot of, all what, the things a, a lot of what we're asking, a lot of the dreams that have been put at the foot of your pedestal um, are things that uh, require more than two people to do. Um, there are lots of options and lots of opportunities, but when you're basically, you know, running an 80 hour a week job, you're sort of staff, uh, some of that's just perhaps going to be pushed down on pushed a little bit further down down the pole. So there's a couple of things that I, I, I need to just sort of go out there and say the kind of things that I say. I'm really, really happy to hear all the things we're doing, but there's a few things that I would want us to focus on on a larger context for the community. I would like at some point for us to have some serious conversations about how we reduce the need, not increase the inventory, but reduce the need for affordable housing. Everyone knows that that's my whole piece here. Widows and orphans will always be with us, but where there, where is there a good job? And so if I can figure out a way to get industry here or to get roles in here that in fact will allow people to have sort of career ladders so that they can in fact achieve the kind of things that Karen was talking about while they might be in this house for this period of time, but in some period of time, we actually are, they're on a, on a pathway to be able to move to um, a higher income and perhaps stay here when they do that and not move to Green or to Stanton or to Waynesboro right. or to Fluvanna or to Louisa. And maybe now there's a growth in, in Nelson, so I'll have to add that to my litany of things. I would also like to have some conversation and perhaps really what I'm doing is building a record for our supervisors. I'd really like to have a conversation about why isn't a land trust option looked at in the same way that an ag or forestral tax break is looked at. So if I give someone a, a tax break to keep their land and whatever kind of farming they want to call it, I have often heard that explained that's to keep people who are marginal farmers in farming. I don't know that the county should be keeping marginal farmers in farming because is that really the best use of their lives and their land? But we're doing it and we're doing it without any sort of consideration on whether or not that's the right use of funding, funding being tax revenues. I would like us to have some conversation, like when you're talking with the, the work, with a work session, or perhaps you will invite us and, and perhaps we will be, be invited to join our supervisors in the work session. But I, that I would hope that there would be a conversation that if a person with a significant amount of land wants to give that into a land trust that a developer could, could that that person gets a tax benefit immediately to do that. And so that what we're then doing is we're setting before the market right. an opportunity for people to make decisions that support what we're trying to do as far as the community is concerned, because I will suggest if we only rely on the market, what we know is the obvious market solutions, 
there's a couple of things that happened there. Clearly, this process and what we do for a builder's piece of property or a developer's piece of property when he or she comes before us, this process puts a level of benefit to them that 10 units back is not the equivalent. It is no way a, sorry, counselor, it is no, it is no quid pro quo that occurs there. And so how do we, as a county of, of, of uh, smart people, I don't know if any of you saw that Albemarle County was, in, was included in the school system that I think we were like fifth or sixth in the, in the, in the, in the Commonwealth for having smart people. <laughs> so when we look at, when we, when we sort of push out the Lake, Lake Wobegon effect here in, in Albemarle County, how do we in fact use all of the various new ways of encouraging signals and sending, sending signals that we want workforce housing here to be something that people can aspire to. I'm going to come back to that for a second. So you said when we start looking at sort of the, the things that we're going to do within the county for county employees and for police, I would also like to have a suggest that we look at the inventory of land that is owned by us. And that's owned by the school system and start thinking about what would it look like, for instance, if we were to do something at the Yancey property? What would it look like if we were to do something with the 60 acres that's up there on Berkmar or Extended or what I think that's what it's called. I don't know what it's called. You know, I know how to get the things. I never know what they're called. And so the thing is, though, if all you're going to be faced with over these next few years is how to convince a bunch of people who really are trying to and, and I, I like developers, this is not an issue, though, but whose business plan is not necessarily to think about how they're going to bring affordable housing to this community. That's not what they're in business to do, and I appreciate that. But we are in the business of trying to shift the equation some. And how do we do that? We have an inventory of land. We have taxing which is something that we can, well, we don't control it, but there's some people who sit in these seats who control it that can in fact help to balance that. And so while I get that we're looking at how do we do this on the more, my real thing is how do we reduce the need? That's about jobs. That's about economic acti uh, activity. And, and also then how do we control the lift and in inventory that we have? And that's things that I think we can do within the purview of this building a little differently. Yeah, it'll make people look a little differently, but also the whole idea that, I would say land trust is no different than ag and forestal tax breaks. And it just depends on where you want to put your tax break. And that, again, is, I'll say that, that's all I'm saying, Chair. That's a hard act to follow, Commissioner Bivens. Um, I, I agree with so much that I've heard here. And I, one of the things I want to go back to, uh, Dr. Pethia, is this tracking tool. And when you think of housing, it's such a big issue, right? It's to me, it almost requires a theory of change, right? Which is like a simplistic way of looking at something big and audacious and, you know, developing metrics to see if we're moving a needle. Is staff creating this tracking tool? Or is this something we're subbing out? But talk to us a little bit about what does that even look like? Uh, well, that's part of it. I don't really know exactly yet. Um, I, I really think there's going to be several different ones. Um, so each program that is created out of Housing Albemarle uh, there will be a system to track the activities through that. Um, and, and, and that's going to be done mainly so that we can see how that particular approach works, right? So if we have the developer incentive program, we track that over, you know, five years and see, did it have any impact? And then where might it be falling down and talk to people and how can we tweak it or do we need to look somewhere else? Um, so you have all of those different things to sort of evaluate the effectiveness of the programs that are being implemented. Um, and that will create like this big pot of data that you can then use to, to, um, to study and see how it's impacting everything around us, how they all work together. Um, and, and so there's going to be several different ways to do this, uh, really tracking the proffer units so we know when they're coming online, what's being built, how much they're being sold for, are they going to the right people, um, where are they located, do we need to, to find ways to really encourage affordable housing in specific neighborhoods that are, are lacking in affordable housing units. So I, I don't see there being one giant tracking tool, but a series of smaller ones that, that look at different things, but that all act together to give a big picture. Okay. 
so there's the like technology that exists that but like i have an invention coming so yeah wow, wow. it's a challenge take yeah. it on take it, take it on for your organization yeah shark tank um Good question when you're done sure sure i have a, a series of questions but feel free to jump in if anything makes sense or resonates um to me it seems that's the critical path item i mean I don't think you could answer how many affordable units we're losing due to the time expiration because we don't have that tracking tool. Right. So we're kind of just walking around blindly in that respect. Um, looking at some of my questions here. We talked about the 80% AMI. That's the number we always hear. And I think I heard the number of 380,000, which is, it seems pretty high to me if you're a teacher or police officer or something like that. How do we get more like 60% or, or another value below 80%? Um, how does that start to look? How does that work? And I know a lot of times also when people hear these numbers, they think it's, you know, Section 8 housing. That's not necessarily what we're talking about. No, no. Uh, I, the housing choice vouchers are Section 8. That's for extremely low income households, right. really. So you're looking at people um, <clears throat> who are close to poverty level or or below that. Um, and so the 60 and 80 percent AMI are really your firefighters and your teachers your nurses, uh, the people who work in the grocery store. Um, that's really the group that we're, we're looking at. Um, you, you know, uh, your, your administrative staff in, in your offices. Right. So uh, the, these are the people that live among us. They help serve us. They work with us. Um, and oftentimes they have to leave because they just can't afford to live here. Um, so one of the things we can do through a, an affordable dwelling unit ordinance is really um, set maximum sale and rental prices. Um, and, and we can work those down closer. So we're looking at probably, um, I think the recommended maximum sale price for affordable housing, which is really gonna be focused um, maximum 80% AMI and below. Um, that would probably be about $214,000, which would actually um, make that affordable to 60, some 60% 60 AMI families, right? Um, and if they have enough assistance through down payment assistance, we can reach families as low as 50% AMI. Mm. Uh, so it's really setting pricing that is um, more achievable for working families. Um, $243,750 is our current maximum sale price, and that's a stretch for anyone below 80% AMI. Um, so really bringing that down. Also bringing down the maximum rental prices, um, and that's really focused at 60% AMI households and below. Um, that is, I think in some ways, our, our biggest focus should really be rental housing at the moment. We have a really big shortage. Um, and if we want families to be able to move or individuals and families to move into home ownership, if you're at that 50, 60% AMI level, it's gonna be really tough for you to save for a down payment assistance or down payment for a house. Um, so be able to have rent levels that are set at a way that they can save um, money over time as they work um, and hopefully work their way up the income ladder, uh, then they will be able to purchase a home a lot sooner than they could. Hmm. When otherwise. do you anticipate that ADU ordinance kind of working um, through the system? It's, uh, so we do have a work session with the board um, on April 19th. So there, there has been um, an ordinance drafted and some administrative guidelines that, that uh, talk about how the whole thing should work. Um, there will be that work session with the board in April. Then we will have a work session with all of you once I get the board feedback. Um, and then as soon as we can after that, go to public hearing with you and then the board. So I'm hoping um, six months at the most. Uh, question for I Steph. say that, but my schedule always changes. So don't hold me to six months. <laughs> I don't want to overstep any boundaries, but is it something to explore to have a joint work session to expedite some of that conversation or? I, it's something we can discuss. Um, I haven't really, we haven't looked into that, but we have done joint work sessions in the past. So if we want to expedite it, it might be an option. And there's some, you had another question. Yeah. I have more, but you go ahead. You know, I, I hope we could have a joint work session because I think there's a lot of planning expertise in the planning commission and that the board would benefit perhaps from having a joint conversation rather than them. I know they control the purse strings, but 
we might have a few good ideas here. Uh, I just wanted to just make a, a just a comment that um, I hope that as we are talking about the importance of affordable housing, that we're also making a direct tie to our ability to attract employers to our county. Uh, because you know, I'm speaking as a small business owner, I just created a new job position in my company, another full-time position. I'm probably going to create some more. And and you know, I contacted you recently, and I just asked you about the AMI, and I asked you for the affordable housing tracker tool. I was asking for myself, not for my house, but you know, as I try to employ people and create positions, I'm trying to figure out if they can afford to live in this county. And so. Um, most business growth in the United States comes from small businesses. It doesn't come from Metas and Googles, which, by the way, as you know, are dramatically uh, de decelerating hiring and laying off thousands of people. So I just I want the county to be really aware that if they want to attract, drop, attract job growth, we have to have an attractive, affordable housing package. To, for anyone to want to be able to bring people here. And the, you may recall there was a certain brewery that wanted to locate in my district. The site was not ready for that particular brewery physically. But my concern also at the time was there was something like 104 jobs or something. And I, I hypothesized that 100 of them would be coming from outside the county and just commuting there because there weren't going to be the affordable housing for those type of jobs. Um, so I just really want us to make a strong emphasis on the, the the link between employers, new businesses, facilitating startups, and the ability to have your workers have a place to live. I can report that my employee did find an affordable place to rent, but it was quite a struggle. So Great. And uh, I had one more question. Uh, you actually took one of mine, which is good. So I don't have to go there. No, it's, it's fine. And it was about like how many, we have a feel for how many employers or businesses we've lost because it's not adequate housing. So economic development, but you've touched on that. Um, general question, like if I were to move to town, how would I know, what would I do to get the information about what units are out there? Like if I'm just new to town, how does that work? Um, that's another thing that I'm trying to work on is come up with a good way to list um, at least the proper units and, and any affordable units that are done through rezonings on our website. Um, but there is also Porchlight, which is hosted by the Regional Housing Partnership. Um, that does provide a listing service for affordable units, um, currently limited to rental units at the moment. They are looking at ways to expand that to affordable home ownership opportunities. Um, <laughs> And that's really about it. I mean, if you, you know, your online rental sites um, and, and property real estate sites are really the only option. So uh, until we come up with a, a good source to advertise on our website, um, one of the reasons I haven't done that yet is because uh, the ADU, the proposed ADU ordinance recommends that those units that come through that program be marketed directly to the people on the waiting list first. Um, before we open those up to the general public. Um, and so it would, once they go through that period and, and off the top of my head, I can't remember how long I say it has to go to them first, uh, but give them that time period to um, people on the waiting list to be able to attempt to rent or purchase those units. And then we would put post them on our website or, or, or another platform. And my last and final question. Um... Is there anything in the ordinance that requires affordable units to be of similar or same quality as surrounding units? I mean, these projects, what I wouldn't want to see is great windows on this one. And then these affordable units, we always ask, hey, are they dispersed or is that a block of affordable units? Less than optimal windows in this one. Or is there anything that starts to talk to quality? I, um, I am... Yeah, yes, I'm fairly certain that there's the requirement that they need to be um, compatible to the to everything. Else. So, I mean, it, it, it's really in that respect reflects our current um, comp plan and, and ordinances that go along and say that those affordable units really need to be. Um, I forget the words we use. Do you remember? I believe it's uh, safe, decent and affordable housing. I believe the word decent is included with uh, um 
with a description. It is, but but it's really um, they they need to 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 fit in. They need to look similar and be a similar quality. So they can't go in and build you know five hundred thousand dollar homes with big fancy amenities and give everybody else a shack. It's they they have to be compat comparable. That's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> Thank you. And any other questions? Lots of good discussion. Just add one more thing. It, it strikes me as someone who's grown up here um, and struggled to afford housing at various times in my own life, that the, the most affordable housing in the county is actually in the rural area. And a lot of the focus on affordable housing often tends to be in the growth area where housing is the most expensive and subsidizing affordable housing is the most expensive. And it does, does strike me that, you know, it'd be great to have some some real metrics on how many low-income people are living in our rural area and, and really get an idea of how much of that affordable housing we're losing in the rural area. Um, I think of it almost like rural gentrification. Um, I've known a lot of a lot of rural communities that have kind of been forced out. Um, and so just something I, I would encourage, you know, as, as you look at building a tool and getting more data, understanding that, um, also, um, in thinking about what Commissioner Bivens had said, just I think too when when I think about when Crozet was at its most affordable, we also had Morton Frozen Foods. So having a big employer was in Crozet was one of the things that made Crozet affordable. So, thank you, Commissioner Murray. Any other comments or discussion? Yeah, I had one. So, Commissioner Bivens pointed out the obvious to us when he pointed out with one and a half or two FTEs. Is that, is that what right. we have? We have two now. Two yes. now. Two now. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> two. How many things that we just talk about, right? That that would be great to have to inform the comp plan to to just look at and understand our affordable housing stock. Things that Dr. Pathia mentioned. She's I mean, at least half a dozen things you mentioned that you were. Yeah. in the process of or <laughs> trying to work on. And so it seems to me that we talk an awful lot about how important it is, affordable housing, right? It doesn't seem like we're actually investing and promoting that right. Sorry. with our staff. So if it's really that important, should we have 2FD? Amen. Amen. Well, the, the second position that was added was one that this commission requested repeatedly be restored we used to have it so there's a certain victory in that some of these things i think could be done through outside studies that we could commission so it doesn't have to be on <laughs> path, yeah, but. Uh, I would, if i could share so you know i just it looked up what our median income here is and so in 2020 so it's a, it's got some age to it now which have, but it's not necessarily been that we haven't seen that those kinds of large salary increases in in the county from from the employers that i know of. um it was forty thousand one hundred or forty thousand two hundred and so that's the median income wow and so if you even were to take 60 percent of that that means we're looking at you know someone having to come up with two thousand dollars a month right and if you then roll through you were asking asking stacy about how do you find these things out well you know just go to zillow just go to Truvia. Just yeah. go and look at what the 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 tr standard apartment rents for here. Many of the pieces, one of the, many of the new projects that we've seen come to us, even in spite of the people across the street believing that they were going to be all Section Eight. When we asked the developer how much the rent was going to be, the developer says it's going to be three thousand mm -hmm. dollars. It was going to be twenty five hundred dollars. That's not what was fine. I understand that they've got to have a return that they absolutely are or are, are do a return on their investment that's that 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 seats that that fits their their profile. But having rents at that level, when the median household income in Albemarle County is forty thousand two hundred dollars, which means that sixty percent that person should be trying to trying to reach to two thousand dollars a month in rent is going to be difficult. That's a, that's a that's that's a difficult um, 
piece of highway to pave. And that number is before taxes are taken out. Before taxes are taken out. So, yeah. And before you have to, you know, put some electricity in that Tesla. That Tesla. Right. May I make one quick comment? Sure. I just, I know we've said this before, but just for the record, um, we also talked in the past with you about the importance of transportation. So to quote a past president of the Piedmont Housing Alliance, and it, an anecdotal story I was given uh, where someone lived in the rural area and they could afford to have this rural house, but they couldn't afford to get to their job. So they ended up giving them four new tires. In other words, getting their car to run was actually the most important thing. And uh, I had been excited for a while that um, a certain um, mobility provider of uh, transportation in our county was going to be providing uh, trips down to Scottsville where there are more affordable houses in that part of the county. And, and that didn't come to pass for a variety of reasons, but really important that we look at that, that transportation piece because a reliable vehicle could be the answer for someone, not just trying to build only in the developed area. So I know you know this, but I just want to put that out. <laughs> That's still on our radar. Absolutely. Thank you. Any any final comments? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank yes. You. Yes. And uh, I would say, Mr. McDermott, we would certainly be interested if the board is amenable to that joint work session. So you can let us know. Um, Thank you. you. I will look them. into it. So thank you. Next on our docket are committee reports. Oh, work to my right and go to the left. Any committee reports? Commissioner Murray? No? No? To my left? No? No? Commissioner Bivens. I just happen to have a, com a committee report. Stacy, don't leave yet. Don't leave yet. Don't leave yet. Stacy, 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 don't leave yet. I just happen to have a committee report that I'm going to recommend all of you figure out a way to do this. So Supervisor McKeel arranged for the Jack Jewett, oh, it's not called the Jack Jewett, the hy hydraulic 29, places 29 hydraulic CAC to go to Southwood yesterday. And I will tell you a few things. So you know they're working on phase one. And Stacy, what you've done with the, that whole process made my heart glad. Now, it is a very complicated thing that they're trying to do because they are trying to move people to places that some of the, that they're going to need to take people off of land so that they can develop that land. And there aren't a lot of places to go in Southwood to do the kind of thing that Karen wants, it, so not the non-displacement but they are really working hard at that. And if you get a chance, I think this goes to the conversation saying about, is it, is it um, comparable? What I can tell you what I saw, and uh, I don't know who these people are, Southern, Southern builders or mm -hmm. Southern development, they're building the market, the at marketplace houses, at, market, at marketplace houses over there. You can tell there's a difference because the, Habitat houses are a little bit smaller. From the outside, they have the same color um, because they have an ARB. They have their own ARB there. And they have a similar look to them. Now, clearly, the ones who are being sold for $600,000 are a little bit bigger. <laughs> it is clear that they're, that they're bigger and a little fancier design. So, you know, they, they pay for a more expensive architect. Um, they did. They did. They did. They did. But it was, it, it felt it for me, it felt like the thing that I was most concerned with, and I'm going to come to this in a second, is that the community was integrating to itself with style and with mm -hmm, economics mm -hmm, and with mm -hmm. and and with people playing this. I I, I think that that feels like now I'm still going to tell you, I'm still concerned about phase two because phase two is where there's going to be the majority of the marketplace house, the marketplace housing, I, Mark, like, was market was market rate, market rate. Thank you, market rate housing. And um, the CEO, Mr. Dan Rogan, so I said that and when this is all over, there could be 500 units out there. But I also should share that those 500 units won't be there when I'm here because it's, there's, a, there's a long tail on that, like 2030, I think he said, something like that. Yeah. So, 
So, so while we're going to get it, as you can see, and this is a group of people who really are trying to put their shoulder at it. I think they're pushing like 45 houses up a year, right, right in that year right now. So they're pushing 45 houses up a year right now with modest resources. They did get some money from Jeff Bezos' former wife, which I think is was helpful. Um, but this is a big lift. And this is a lift from a group of people that this is what they do on a daily day basis. And this is a big lift on a, yeah, there's a, there's, this, this site is problematic. I mean, most of you, I don't have to rehash the, the infrastructure issues out there, but there is significant fear. And so figuring out how to move people, how to build houses, how to build communities that are in fact, that embrace a diversity is not, is something that we can do clearly, but it's not done overnight. It is not done right, overnight. Right. And so I would advise each of you to go out there and give Dan a hard time. Don't tell Dan that I gave him any compliments. because I, I he, went quietly alone and yeah. spoke to no one. Okay, but. fine. Don't tell Dan that Julian said that he was doing a good job because I don't, I don't want Dan to hear that coming out of my lips. But um, I would say that when Stacy stood before us in a number of years ago, that um, I can just compliment the work that she's doing with the staff person that's over there and how she's pushed people it will become, I think, a very, a, a welcoming place, a place that any of us would probably um, could see ourselves living in. And so I just, I wanted to say that to you before you left. It's a fantastic update. Any, any questions for Commissioner Bivens? Oh, if you go, don't tell Dan that I said I was real pleased now. You know, I gotta have to maintain this sort of thing. <laughs> I have to maintain, yeah, I have an image to maintain. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mr. McDermott, uh, we'll call for a Board of Supervisors report. Yes, thank you. Uh, March 1, Board of Supervisors meeting. Um, uh, one item on the agenda in the afternoon was uh, uh, regarding Freebridge Lane project. I don't know if you all have been following that, but it looks like a really uh, great um, effort that we're making to actually uh, close Freebridge Lane between Darden Cow and 250 uh, and turn that into a bike ped uh, resource, um, oh, okay. Uh, okay. a promenade, as they uh, oh, spoke <laughs> highly of throughout the meeting, uh, or promenade. Uh, they, promenade. They were had a discussion about the actual pronunciation, but um, and and they approved a pilot pro project to do that. Uh, so what we're gonna what we're looking at now is um, the idea of of trying to get some gates out there, close it up and see how it's received, see how it operates, make sure it doesn't have any unintended consequences, and hopefully over time, rethink that corridor. We have, there's some design plans that you can look at that we worked with a uh, landscape architect at to sort of really make that more of like a, uh, a green street type area that, you know, is, um, fits in with the, the riverside. So great little project they're working on. I thought you might be interested to hear about that is moving forward. Uh, in the evening, we had a public hearing, and I think apparently they, the board heard that you all had a meeting that went until 1130 at night, and they said we can beat that oh, wow. because Old Ivy Residences was here until a little after midnight um, with a lot of public comment, and in the end, it was uh, unanimously approved to move forward. So um, it was a, a, a long night, but I think a, a overall a good outcome with the with the uh, the development that they're proposing out there. Fantastic. Anything else, Mr. McDermott? No, more questions. They heard, and they heard, I mean, I think people should the, the commission should hear that 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 the applicant came back and had heard us. Yes, there, I I think so. Yeah, there were improvements to the. Okay. There there were additional proffers included in the uh, related to transportation. Uh, of course, there was a lot good. of questions about transportation that came out of this, and then the follow up with the proposal that VDOT had uh, referred mm -hmm. to as the triangle about over there on the western end. Uh, well, the the interesting thing about that is that VDOT has put that project on hold and has offered to do a um, a corridor study. The, the concerns from the community were that we weren't looking big enough when we were looking at that triangle about idea. There could be unintended consequences, things like that. So the community wanted us to look at a broader area. So VDOT is now funding a study that'll really look at the entire corridor, Ivy Road corridor from 
Boar's Head all the way to the city line. So that's something um, that we'll be working on over the next year and hopefully get some recommendations to move into the smart scale application period next year uh, with, with new projects. So <clears throat> great. So sounds good. I guess we can move into new business and I'll ask for the AC44 update, our standing agenda item. Yes. Um, so uh, we are finalizing really the efforts that were in part one of phase two, uh, which is really focusing in on those topic areas right now. Uh, we have been spending a lot of time going out to uh, various committees, um, uh, technical committees that the county has updated, uh, that the county um, has uh, tasked with, you know, mm -hmm. addressing certain topic areas, uh, natural heritage committee, I attended them, then Tori and Ben have been in other committees. Uh, we've been meeting with other um, agencies, including uh, ACSA, schools, having discussions with them to figure out how we can uh, address their needs through the comp plan. The uh, survey is open until Friday that is online. We are approaching 500 respondents to that, really big numbers. Uh, and beyond that, we've also got our working group that is going out and uh, talking to members of the community. We've been having pop-ups. I know the PC has been getting uh, notifications when those pop-ups are coming to their districts. Uh, those are going on through this week as well. And then we're moving into the next phase, which will be the um, the plan planning toolkits and looking at things like growth management and uh, multimodal corridor plans. And uh, I'll be having more conversations with all the members of the planning commission on that in the very near future. Sounds good. Any any questions for Mr. McDermott? Just a quick question. I'm, I know that there's a, a pop-up for my district on a Wednesday afternoon, and there was one in Scottsville down the street from my office, and I had to go to my actual day job, can't attend those. I'm just curious, are we doing any of these? You know, these are like holding them in the middle of the day is obviously for retired people or people have nighttime jobs and can go. So I'm trying to understand, is there like evening ones, weekend ones? Is there enough of that? We had a, we had an evening one uh, in the Jewett district just last week. And it was, I have to say, it was, it was too cool because Greer School, I think that's the right name for it, um, had a bingo night. You can imagine a cafeteria filled with young kids playing bingo. It was incredible. <laughs> but in order to get past their card, you know, to buy their cards, they had to go buy David and um, who's the gentleman who, that's like the staff person. Ben. And Ben. David and Ben to get these palm cards that they could sign on to or if they wanted to do it there because there were parents there. There were parents there also. But they And they could have a clipboard and just fill out a, a, a questionnaire. So, and I saw people there doing it. Plus, I'm just trying to see if Southern Albemarle is going to only have things during the day when we'll farmers to. are working and lots of we'll people are at work. Uh, so. Yeah, we're working to spread those times all around. Okay. I can I can talk to the the team and see if we can identify the 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 point of the pop ups was we wanted to go to places where people are already at at those times, yeah. and so we show up there because we know other people are mm -hmm. going to be there anyway, and we're trying to meet okay. them. So grocery stores, markets, we have done some on weekends as well, but uh, I'll check to see if we can find something. And if you have suggestions okay. for things, places, uh, items like that that are occurring in your district, um, let us know because that's that's how we found out right, about like, these pop ups. Like Facebook has music on Saturday. Saturday nights if you yes. came an hour before that or so, you know I'm not saying that's the best spot but because there's not a lot of parking but anyway there there I I just want to be as creative as we can with uh getting all different types of people with crossroads yeah, store. I think the crossroads store would be perfect yeah. Yeah. on a Saturday night thousands of people are done <laughs> oh, oh <laughs> down okay yeah <laughs> And they're all and they're all waiting, so they might. Yeah, have yeah. <laughs> they're all out. See, I know you really want a pizza, but we need to hear about the county's comp plan. Yeah, yeah we'll be doing more pop ups. I'll, I'll touch okay. base with you all and see all if right. you all have some suggestions because we were it, it was wasn't easy coming up with good places for yeah, that. And I so. know the Scott's one was tying into another event as well, but yeah, I'm just I just looked at the times and I was kind of scratching my head. All right, thanks. Sure. sure. Uh, any old business for the good of the order? All right. Hearing none, looks like we'll be adjourning before the, the stated time on the agenda. It's okay. <laughs> All right. So at 7.53.
three. Is there a motion to adjourn? Ooh, so moved. All right, all right. All right, with that, the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>